Good morning again. When Jesus was on the cross, there were people who mocked him and hurled insults at him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. If he is the Christ, the Messiah, the King of Israel, let him come down and then we will believe. And it's not hard to imagine that the enemies of Jesus were absolutely delighted as they believed Jesus was being eliminated. No longer a problem to them. And some people in the crowd who were there that day, might have had great hopes for Jesus. But now would be saying, wow, so much for that. What a fizzer. We shouldn't have got our hopes up. What a weak way to end a promising life. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus looked anything but a hero. He looked like a loser. And his death was one of the most, or the most undignified one you could have in the ancient world. If Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear was there, he'd be doing the loser, loser, which he loved to do all the time. And if we were there, we might have joined in with him as well. Who knows? The disciples didn't mock Jesus, but they were devastated. They were distraught, which in in a way is another way of showing that they believed that Jesus was a loser. But... Despite how things looked, it took great strength for Jesus to submit to crucifixion. He was eternal God. He had the power of miracles. He could control the forces of nature. He could have easily called a thousand angels down to stop the procedure. But he didn't. It took great strength because he had a mission in dying on the cross in this undignified way was part of his mission. If we just backtrack a little bit um, to Gethsemane when they came to arrest him. Now Jesus could have with a wave of his hand Caused all those soldiers to have a heart attack. That would have been easy for him. But he didn't. Because being arrested was part of a greater plan, part of his mission. It took strength to submit to that mission. It took great strength and courage for Jesus to did what he did, to do what he did. Jesus was not a loser. He was a man with a purpose. And in Philippians chapter 2, you and I are told that we are to have the same mind of Jesus. We are to have courage and strength so that we might put the interests and needs of other people ahead of our own. That takes courage and strength. Which brings me to the theme for today. And um, I'm just going to change the batteries while we're talking. Our theme for today is the believer's gentleness. Our gentleness. And it, it takes courage and strength to show gentleness. It's not for the weak. And our two Beatitudes for today, which have already been um, announced to you earlier, is blessed are the meek. Verse 5 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the meek, 
for they will inherit the earth. And verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So let's jump into it. And our first one is blessed or blessed are the considerate. So you'll notice immediately I've changed a word here. And very deliberately. I changed the word because meek is so misunderstood these days and we have so much baggage around meek. So I just want to give a different spin this morning. In our culture, meek often means you are a weak person. A meek person is someone who is a pushover. And that is not what is being talked about here. So that's the wrong definition of meek. The Greek word that's used um, in, in Gospel of Matthew can also mean gentle, humble, kind, and considerate. So I've chosen considerate, and I hope blessed other considerate will help you and me understand better what Jesus is getting at and think of it in a slightly fresh way. It is written in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Silk is a wonderful material. I don't think I own anything that's silk, but I heard about it. Silk's a wonderful material, and a single strand of silk is stronger by far than an equivalent strand of steel. Scientists are still searching for the secret that gives silk so much strength. It's a wonder of nature. It has the properties of strength and it has the properties of gentleness. To follow the lead of Jesus requires strength and gentleness. And I think you and I already know that sometimes that can be really, really hard. But that is what we are called to do. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wrestled so vigorously with the thought of going to the cross that he shed sweat that was blood. It was distressing to him. But then he said, not my will, but yours be done. So from there on, he deliberately and consciously and freely chose to go to the cross and drink the bitter cup. When you and I follow his lead and consciously choose to put someone else's interests before ours with a Christ-like attitude, we are doing it willingly. And if we are doing it willingly, we will not think of ourselves as being treated as a doormat, even when some people might choose to take advantage of us because we are following the lead of Christ. We do it willingly and freely, and it makes all the difference. It takes strength, and it takes gentleness. Generally speaking in our world, if you think of the history of the world, generally speaking, the people who get ahead are the pushy people, the self-promoting people. Generally speaking, the history of the world is the history of people who get ahead, the ones who get ahead value power, they value influence and wealth but that is not the way of Jesus his is the opposite way to the general trend of the history of the world as it says or as Jesus said blessed are the meek blessed are the considerate for they will inherit the earth the spoils will belong to the considerate the meek who follow in the footsteps of Jesus and not the pushy people, not the people who seek power, 
and control of others. I had David read from Psalm 37 earlier. Psalm 37 is a a fantastic cross-reference and it might have been exactly what Jesus wanted everyone to think of when he, when he said, blessed are the meek, blessed are the considerate. And you know, we could say a summary of Psalm 37, you can read all of it perhaps later on, but it's kind of saying, okay, the pushy people, the self-centred people may have more than you will in your lifetime, but one day they will have nothing. Psalm 37 is saying, if you follow the ways of the Lord, you might not have much now. But one day, you will have everything. That's what it's saying. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. Uh, most of you know that I have a fairly deep connection with the Pijanjara people. And for the Pijanjara people, being a um, First Nation people, the idea of country is of vital importance. It's of vital importance to all Aboriginal people of Australia. Country. The idea of country. And it's also my dream, some of you know, to be able to go back to Annabella and do more teaching, scripture teaching. And, and one of the things I've had to think about is, as I talk about country, as they talk about country, how do I bring the gospel to bear into the conversation of country. And I'd have to say, from a historic point of view, without any planning on my own behalf, I happened to be at Ernabella in 1981 when the official paperwork was signed, when they were given back full ownership of the APY lands. It was a great privilege, and it was, it, meant, it was something special for them. It, it was a great affirmation for them to actually officially have control of their lands, or at least part of their lands. And so that's got to be honoured, and that's got to be respected. But they won't get all their lands. And there are other First Nation groups who won't get their lands. So how do you bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus to the discussion of country and the importance of country? Well, as I gave that some thought, without wanting to minimise any issues of natural justice that are involved in the whole matter, I kind of have thought that maybe what I want to say is, OK, some of you may never get back your lands. Never. But remember this one thing, that everyone who is a follower of the Lord Jesus will get back all their lands and more. The Pijanjara people will not only get all Anangu land, they will get all of Adelaide, they will get all of Melbourne, they will get all of Australia, they will get all of Africa, they will get all of Japan, they will get everything. And the other side of it is, if you don't belong to Jesus, that which you win by law will be taken away from you. And it will be given to those who do follow Jesus. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I'm, I'm a bit behind there. Inherit the earth. <clears throat> and this is the same for you and me. My uncle friends, so that's just one illustration. It's the same for you and me too. Some of you own a house. And I wonder what it was like when you got your house. I wonder what you felt, whether you felt you had some kind of real, you know, significant achievement and it's a blessing to you and it gives you security, uh, a place you call your own. And as a non-householder, a house owner... I um, hope it's not too disrespectful, but let me say, whatever you feel about your house, that's peanuts. That's peanuts. Compared to what God is planning for you and promising for you. 
And when he says we will inherit the earth, he's talking about the earth that he will renew and remove all evil and danger. An earth that he'll be able to look at, upon again and say it is very, very good. That's the earth that we will inherit. And everyone who believes in Jesus and believes in what the Father says about Jesus, that he's the saviour, inherits everything. It'll be all yours one day. Everything. It'll be all mine. Everything. Everyone who confesses the name of Jesus and Lord and Saviour will inherit everything. Earthly boundaries, earthly politics are temporary and they will vanish. Under Jesus, we will all be one. John Lennon, eat your heart out. Let's move on to our second one. Blessed are the peacemakers. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Jesus was meek, he was considerate, he was humble, and he was willing to put aside his own interests for a purpose. And his great purpose was to bring us peace with God. As it says in Romans 8 verse 1, Through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. And again, in Colossians, it is written, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Jesus, all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And this is the peace that also reconciles division between tribes and nations and countries when we are under the banner of Jesus, the peacemaker. And it is this peace that's also supposed to become part of our character and our nature and our behaviour. As it says in Romans 12 verse 18, if it's possible, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And I don't think Jesus would mind if I reword verse 9 a little bit. How fortunate are the peacemakers? Because they show that they are the sons and daughters of God. I want to take this and apply it to a very contemporary issue. One that you and I, um, as Australians and as Christians, are going to have to think about and bring our peacemaking character to. We are told that this year we have a referendum on the voice. An advisory body of First Nations people at least at the federal government level. That is what we're being told. There's going to be a referendum. And as we move towards that, you and I need to be very careful of the people who are just kicking up dust and stirring up confusion. Um, They're really trying to poison us against it without necessarily saying they're openly against it. But some of the things I have heard and read are just straight out wrong and inaccurate and sensational, and um, what, or what would you might say, fear-mongering. So we need to be careful of that side. And we also need, at the same time, for our current government to be clear about what they're going to put forward. Because it's hard to have a discussion about something that we don't know what we're talking about exactly. So we need a lot to happen. We need, need to have a bit of patience before we make our conclusions and not panic just yet. But what I want to say, despite the different voices that are happening, most of all, most of all, you and I need to listen to the voices of First Nation people who have asked that there be a voice. 
The First Nation people who gathered together to come up with this request. And I might even say, having read um, some of their statements, that sometimes we might even need to look past their words because we might be using English but might be saying different things or we need to look past their words to see what their hearts are really after. We need to listen to the voices of First Nation per people. Um, I thought I, I should buy, as I'm somebody interested in Aboriginal things, um, this book here. Um, this book is um, Finding the Heart of the Nation by Thomas Major. Now, Thomas Major is a relatively young man, but after the um, Uluru Agreement, he was designated the man to go around with the petition that they came up with and talk to different Aboriginal communities about it. And he gathered stories. And in this book, uh, not only his stories, but there's 20 stories of what this whole Uluru Statement means to Indigenous people. And in the start of the book, it starts with a heading that says, An Invitation to Listen. And it, right at the end of the book, it's, um, there's a chapter called, Now Walk With Us. An Invitation to Listen and Now Walk With Us. And it's disciples of Jesus who are called to be considerate. You and I can do that. We can listen. That's something we can do. We ought to be glad to do that. And we ought to be willing to walk alongside others to understand them. That's not so hard. We can do that. You know, I grew up with Aboriginal people as a young boy, from, infant, from an infant to a young boy. But it's only really the last five years or so that I have started reading about the history of massacres in this country. And it's hard reading. It's um, gut-wrenching at times, one at a time is enough. And these massacres aren't just ancient history that we put off to another time. The last official massacre happened after my mother was born. And you can see, when you start to think of it that way, see how the memories of these atrocities are fresh in the minds of First Nation people. And some of the people who committed the massacres we have honoured and put up plaques to. Something bad has happened in our country, and we haven't been talking about it, and it's new to me to actually be reading about it. And in the last five years, I've also been learning the history of slavery of Aboriginal people. Not the kind of slavery that we're sort of used to thinking about when we think of the USA, but it's still slavery. Slave labour. And it was very common. And I've also come to realise recently something that I had never understood or wanted to face that there's no other way of speaking about Australia other than it is stolen land. We can't just say times were different back then. The British actually broke international law back then. It was against the law then. And they also deliberately hid evidence about Aboriginal villages. Aboriginal agriculture, Aboriginal nationhood. This is all kind of new to me. I once heard Australian author Thomas Keneally say, there can be no peace without justice. And I think God says the same thing. The statement, the Uluru statement from the heart should interest those of us who are called to be peacemakers. We should know something about it. We should make an effort. What does it talk about? Well, it talks about a, a voice to Parliament and a, an advisory voice. It talks about a truth commission regarding the sins of the past to lead us towards 
a healing. It also talks about treaty. The clock can't be turned back to the way it was, but maybe something can be done. And these things aren't new. They aren't radical new ideas. This is William Cooper. William Cooper was born in 1860. A yorta yorta elder. A devout Christian. A man passionate about justice, truth and peace. Not just for Aboriginal people. Read his story. He believed that everyone was created in the image of God. William Cooper was one of the founding members, if not the founding member of the Australian Aboriginal League. And they spoke about some of the same things back then, in the 20s and 30s. So what we're talking about now is not new. They use maybe different words, but it's basically the same kind of thing. And in 1938, they called for a day of mourning on the 26th of January. And people did march in Sydney on the 26th of January for the day of mourning. There are 365 days in the year. And I can't comprehend why we so stubbornly stick to the one day, the one date that is so distressing to the original people of this country. It is the day that is the start of their decimation. It is the date of the start of their humiliation. For them, it has to be a day of mourning. William Cooper advocated that in 1938 and we have not advanced. I'm not talking about politics here. I am talking about justice, truth, understanding and peacemaking. Jesus is interested in those things. And you and I as followers of Jesus ought to be interested in those things as well. We might approach the conversation from different angles. But what I want to say is we can't not get involved. We can't not be involved. Look at these verses from James chapter 3. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Then peace-loving. Considerate, meaning it's gentle and tolerant and understanding. Submissive, meaning it's compliant or it's fair and it's reasonable. So the wisdom from above is fair and reasonable. It is full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial. That means it's non-judgmental. It's impartial and it's sincere meaning without hypocrisy. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Jesus today and we pray that we would take them seriously as we think about our day-to-day -day lives and as we think about the bigger issues in our country and our society as well. May the Holy Spirit guide us and lead us in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.